Okay, so this um, is lecture number 39 out of 41 lecture series on creating an international sustainable civilization today. And uh, my initial reason for creating this is teaching a class, uh, a philosophy class at the University of Indonesia, but also teaching to a number of professors at the Islamic State Universities in Indonesia. The main point, however, is that somebody, pretty much anybody, as far as I'm concerned, could listen to any one of the lectures and the patterns that I'm pushing for, the way of the kind of education that I'm trying to develop in my in my readers, uh, the, my students, um, the education of the mind is the education in pattern recognition, the idea of the good leading to wisdom uh, that anybody could gain from. And I developed this by studying Greek uh, philosophy, Plato and Aristotle, and then the culture, how the civilization is trying to develop the mind. But my, this lecture is about current um, academics, or one is a doctor, one is a trauma specialist, one is a social psychologist. Some of them teach college, some of them are practitioners. Any sort of intellectual leader, professional leader, are, are acting as prophets. Now, they don't think of themselves as prophets, and that's because of this split between religion and science or between the sacred and the secular. That's because they don't think that there are these patterns that were established in the old wisdom traditions that are still playing themselves out. And this is unfortunate. So I'm trying to really recreate the wheel or recreate a bridge between all these disciplines and all these professions that have gotten so split from each other unnecessarily and even in a way that makes it extremely difficult for us to develop a sustainable civilization. So um, why are these people prophets? Because they're criticizing the political leaders, the economic leaders, people in power. So they're speaking truth to power. They happen to have some power and authority, luckily, but all of them, I think, were trained in a way that didn't give them the tools to criticize in the way they are now. It's they, especially um, the first two, they got trained in thinking only in terms of material causes. And they know that their professional life has been rewarded by thinking in terms of material causes only. And they're, they're pushing back and they realize, no, all of them refer back to either directly to Aristotle or to the, old, to the, the wisdom traditions as the solution to the problems that we have in our contemporary society. Now, all of these problems originated in the US but that's because the U.S. is the most controlled by international corporations. But those corporations are sending all of these toxic, cultural, culturally toxic forces into the rest of the world. Indonesians are being harmed by them. Some of this is a repeat from an earlier lecture, but I, it adds to it and I think it put some closure on it. And so thinking of it as, I didn't refer to it as prophets earlier. So now you can put these two together. All right, so uh, the corruption of global capitalism, that's number one. It's led by the US, the call of the world's prophets and prophetic tradition to expose the greed and its profoundly damaging effects. All the world's religious leaders focus how greed is destroying human beings and life on earth. 
This is what the conference at the Pontifical Academy, the working group, they all agreed on the main problem is indifference, uh, materialism, distraction. So these people all agree and we have to, we have to just keep saying it and work together. We need to gather together to solve these problems, not argue about relatively important issues, like who's the real Muslim or Christian or American or whatever. Lecture number 22 discusses how the globalization process was mismanaged. A few very greedy Americans got control of the process and structured a system that's harmful to developing nations and also impoverishes most Americans. Global capitalism today is making human beings into commodities to exploit for money, exploit their bodies, exploit their minds. So David Orr, in his book, Birth in Mind, he has a, one of the chapters is called Prices and the Life Exchanged, the cost of the US food system. The price of food does not include damage to natural systems. Soil erosion, pesticides, cancer, livestock manure, pollution, methane, not livestock manure that leads to pollution, water pollution, methane into the air and undermining the ozone layer. Food packaging is one third of solid wastes, losing the ecological basis for rural communities intelligence about land. So the children of farmers, most of them have moved into cities and gotten different jobs. So now the indigenous knowledge, we talked about the knowledge of indigenous tribes and the ones who have control over the, um, the land they live on. This is knowledge we need. But even in farms, white people living on farms from Europe, whose relatives came from Europe, their children are losing intelligence about the land. Agriculture as an act of, yeah, agriculture is now an act of domination to force even higher yields from land. So we have chicken factories, factory farms is what we have. Chicken, turkeys, um, dairy is, you know, I've, I've been in a dairy farm a factory dairy farm where the cows are there and, and their udders are tied to machines. And so the machines milk the cows. Oh gosh, all of it is so impersonal and it all creates quantity, right? But the quality of human life is um, degenerating. So there, you know, there is a balancing act about how to actually feed our overpopulated globe without creating food that just accelerates climate change. So more and more people get sick faster. <laughs> you know, they, they die from air pollution because the air pollution is because you had to make enough chickens and enough plants or whatever so that they could eat, you know, they die of starvation or they die of air pollution or they die of cancer that comes from all the pollutants in the air, whatever. Um, there, we are not anticipating the climate crisis. We're not factoring into the crisis, the costs of what's gonna happen as the climate changes. And there's huge costs already. Insurance companies are shelling out money to pay for Strong, stronger hurricanes, stronger cyclones, stronger tornadoes, more floods, more droughts, but it's never factored into the cost of food. Most so-called food damages health, but there, and then profits are made in creating products to sell the remedy. That's terrible. First, they make you sick, they destroy the environment, then you make money trying to make you well. You're never going to get well <laughs> because that product also pollutes the environment. So you just stay sick or you get sick with something else. The most important cause of these problems is the way we think about economics or industrial mindset. Okay. 
again, as a philosopher, it's the mindset. So David Orr, the economy is the central institution of modern life, and it's dedicated to permanent growth. Economic man by nature is the model. That's not true. We're biological by nature. Technology is mostly good, but it can be misused. We are not by nature creatures that rationally calculate the most efficient means to our economic self-interest. We're biological creatures. We reproduce. We love our children. We want to protect our children from harm. We do all sorts of stuff. Parents make all sorts of economic sacrifices to um, so their children can go to college. Not because their children are going to make money for them, because they love their children. Ha! Oh, amazing. Um, we convert agricultural research and education from a broadly conceived enterprise with technological aspects and based on a solid agrarian philosophy and morality. So that was what it used to be, right? It had technology and that was fine. But now we've converted that into technical specializations. We've separated it into these pieces with the goal of just making more money. 1972 land grant college research. So these land grant institutions were developed so that professors would do research, students would learn current research, but it was all done in the interest of agribusiness, the huge corporations, rather than more indigenous kinds of knowledge. Um, the chemical industry, food engineers, food processors, conglomerates, and banks were the ones that benefited and controlled what was being researched. They decided what was going to get funded. Federal policies defer ecological and social debts to the future electorate. You know, eventually it gets so bad, people will vote for politicians that want uh, environmental protection, but it will be so too little too late. 1990, farmers have strong financial incentives to plant just a few crops and use energy-intensive chemical means of fertility maintenance and pest control. And this happened all over the world. This was a huge uh, climate-destroying, food-corrupting <laughs> movement, but there was a philosophy behind it. And that's important to remember. Okay, second book, The Hacking of the American Mind. This I referred to earlier. The, in this book, I'm going to develop separate and parallel. This is the prophet, right? David Orr is a prophet. Stop, stop. You know, he published those books a long time ago. In this book, I'm going to develop separate and parallel scientific cultural, historical, economic, and social arguments that our minds have been hacked. I think this was a 2014 book. This hack, the system, systematic confusion and conflation of the concepts and definitions of pleasure and happiness has been inserted into the limbic system, the emotional part of our brains, thereby precipitating a slow motion crash of a 25 to 50% of individuals and exacting a severe detrimental impact on our whole society. This was not accidental. It was specifically designed and engineered with the profit motive. It continues to be executed by private interests with governmental support. So the latest research I heard was 50% of Americans, no, 80% of Americans over age 50 have a metabolic disorder, which means their, their um, minds have been hacked. Their dopamine system has been hacked so that they live on dopamine pleasure highs 
and they go from high to low constantly. Um, and it and it messes up their metabolism. This imbalance in the limbic system hacks our decision-making capacity. So Aristotle's model of practical wisdom, you have to hit the mean between extremes, which you have to step back, think of the options, what are the extremes, what's best, why? And long-term, learn from lessons. The limbic, you know, the hacking into the dopamine system um, makes it so people act impulsively and they do overreact and they don't remember what they did earlier. They don't tie it. They don't learn from mistakes. We need to connect biochemistry, neuroscience, genetics, physiology, medicine, nutrition, psychology and psychiatry, public health, economics, philosophy, theology, history, and law. Right now, these are in the service of corporate. We have to change the paradigm. So again, paradigm shift. And it's a paradigm shift from the modern view, profit motive, science, and social science, to, excuse me, to a systems view, which is also consistent with the ancient view. Sugar, excuse me. Our food system is designed to make us addicted to sugar. Sugar causes a change in our biochemistry and it causes a metabolic syndrome, a metabolic imbalance, dysfunction. It links nutrition and physical health with behavioral health. When we eat sugar, our health declines, we get diabetes and also our behavior. We act impulsively and we, we don't establish a good life history. So the main issue here is that pleasure is confused with contentment. So the reward pathway in the brain is hacked and it makes it impossible for the contentment pathway in the brain to actually function. And he goes back to Aristotle he has an Aristotelian distinction. He says it's Aristotle's distinction between pleasure and contentment. And Aristotle's view of happiness is activities of soul in accordance with virtue. So he, Aristotle's view of happiness is contentment. It's not pleasure. Okay, what's the difference? Completely different pathways in the brain and different regulation. Reward is short-lived. Contentment is longer. You achieve a goal. Reward is visceral. It triggers the body's fight-or-flight system versus contentment is calming. Reward is, a, is connected to substances, drugs. Caffeine is a drug. Alcohol, sugar, right? These are drugs. Of course, heroin and cocaine are drugs, but these are drugs. Contentment is tied to achievements. Reward is taking and winning. Contentment is giving. Aristotle, we are social and political. Generosity is a major virtue. It's the foundation for all the other virtues. Ambition, honor, friendships, sociability. They all are related to the contentment pathways of the brain. Reward is yours alone. Contentment is for others and society. Again, very Aristotelian. Reward causes misery, right? You're happy, you're miserable. You're happy, you're miserable. Contentment, you're never miserable. Reward is driven by dopamine. Contentment is driven by serotonin. These are different brain processes. Reward leads to diabetes and heart disease cancer and dementia. My gosh, the, the, the number of Americans who have these diseases, unbelievable. Even in children, that's what he's most upset about. He's, he works with pediatric, with children. The world's spiritual traditions, he goes back to these spiritual traditions that rejected pleasure and materialism, right? 
Religion has been the arbiter of pleasure and happiness since religion began. And he is tying, right? Aristotle is a natural foundation. Aristotle is consistent with these religious traditions. Science and religion shouldn't be split, but you can unify them through Aristotle. Christianity emphasized happiness after death. Pleasure is de the devil on earth. Uh, pain as humility and service is the way to happy afterlife, right? So he's not in favor of this anti-physical stuff. That's a, that's not humanist either. But he, he does point out that it does tell people to reject pleasure and immediate gratification and getting addicted to shopping, right? That's evil. So if people have are living on dopamine, then if they think that's natural, they think sin, you know, we're born sinners, but we have to resist it in order to go to heaven. And so in Aristotle's model, the best you can do is moral strength, that you know it's right, you don't want to do it, but you do it anyway, right? If you think you're born a sinner, but you know you're going to think that if your if your mind has been hacked and you go on dopamine day in day out, then you'll think the only way for me to you know change is is to threaten myself, deny myself any pleasure, right? Uh, and otherwise, it go to hell. Like you scare yourself. And you picture hell as a matter of pleasure and pain, right? You'll burn in hell, you know? So you have to use dopamine. You have to use pleasure and pain, even when you're projecting into the afterlife, which when you don't have a body, I don't see how you're going to feel pleasure and pain. But anyway, it's clearly dopamine. But happiness, serotonin, human flourishing for Aristotle if you really understand happiness correctly, it is natural and, and it isn't anti-physical. It isn't anti-natural. It is natural. Human flourishing, growth, physical and spiritual. It's not prone to acute changes. It's unrelated to circumstances, but it's not anti-body. It leads to a flourishing body. Advertising rewires the human brain. It's exploited for money. It's based on a pro-capitalist worldview. Today's most successful marketing strategies are the, it's called the corporate consumption complex. The six biggest industries are based on, are hedonistic, based on this kind of dopamine pleasure. Tobacco, alcohol, food, and behavioral triggers like guns, cars, or four-wheelers, right? Get that revving. Um, and energy, all right? So um, there's, there's a constant improving in new techno techniques in marketing based on neuroscience. So neuroscience has studied the dopamine pathways. They get better and better at exploiting them. Freedom has been corrupted, and this happened in Athens. Freedom and democracy means everyone is free to live as they like. That's what happened in Athens. Freedom meant you're free to pursue pleasure, wealth, power, popularity, notoriety, whatever. And that's what made Athens great. It's not true. Athens, democracy is based on practical wisdom. All right. It's so he's referring to this without even referring to Plato. He doesn't ever refers to Plato or Athens. Um, he's he's founded on Aristotle. That's why when I say Aristotle and Plato, it's the same model of wisdom. I think it's important. Capitalism, the notion that greed is good because it motivates people to work hard, it also causes them to blame themselves if they fail. And yet they spend billions of dollars hacking people's minds so that they will fail. They're set them up to fail. And then they say, it's your fault if you fail. 
dualism is to deny, repress, or condemn the body and its desires. All that means is you fluctuate between giving into the desires and repressing and condemning. Then you hate yourself, you blame yourself, you uh, shame yourself, you criticize other people for being self-indulgent, you judge people. You compete against them for more money. It's just awful. It destroys civilization. The purpose of scientific re, uh, re research, like the research that gets funded, is aims to exploit nature. Um, originally, it was for human well-being, right? Now, the funding for a lot of research is done by corporations to exploit the dopamine system or the cortisol system fear. All right, America's pro-capitalist worldview and its foundation for colonialism and the global capitalist system today. Knowledge of the land and how to live sustainably of the Native Americans was worthless, right? Our founders said God wanted the Europeans uh, wanted the Native Americans to be removed by force if necessary to make way for progress, right? The Homestead Act. Move into this land, cut down the trees. If you make it valuable, if you homestead it, you've, you've cultivated it, created products you can bring to the marketplace and you created that economic value that's what God wants. Rational and industrious, industrious people, the Native Americans, this is quoting, are lazy and contentious. They're lazy because they don't work up the land. And when you run them off the land, they're contentious. They fight back. So they're bad. We are God's will. We are doing God's will, literally out of John Locke. A mechanistic model for the economy. People buy what they want most efficiently and it makes them happy, right? Oh, we're just making people happy. This is what people want. Meanwhile, you know, you're engaged in all this research to hack the brain so they actually want it, even though you know it won't make them happy. The government should not regulate business because um, they will do it Government politicians will do it according to the donations of the political donors and supporters, not according to what's economically beneficial. Well, we've gotten to the point where the richest people control all the political campaigns. And so the, the politicians do, uh, do whatever their donors and supporters say, but those are the economic leaders and they're the richest ones. And so... Uh, so this minimal government means also to reject any sort of regulation, any sort of politicians that actually want to stop this, that um, the capitalists will say, oh, no, that's inefficient. <laughs> it's crazy. God wanted Europeans to colonize the world, taking natural resources, making them into marketable products, selling them back. This was the way to prosperity and a higher standard of living. So, you know, I think it was always flawed, but it's becoming more and more obvious, you know, as the exploitation gets more severe. What about stress? Stress is related to um, fear and cortisol. So there's a stress, fear, memory pathway. That, it, that triggers the amalga, the hippocalamus, all these, right, the hippocampus, prefrontal cortex. Um, and so that also, you know, prevents people from being able to live, have a contented life. Obesity ruins the dopamine system. Stress makes it worse. Right, because that system, because um, if you add food, the leptin extinguishes the dopamine signal, right? So you eat more food, it kills the dopamine, the, um, 
it, it destroys the dopamine, right? Obese people, the neurons are immune to leptin. So the leptin doesn't kick in. So the dopamine signal doesn't stop. So they just eat more. So they get more obese. The long-term exposure to cortisol will actually kill you because stress, long-term stress, this part of your brain kicks in. The long-term, it will kill you, but slowly. When pressures are relentless, your cortisol response can remain elevated for days, months, or years. So this happened to my son for a decade. Then he got neuroendocrine cancer. Evidence of the associations between job stress, psychological distress, elevated cortisol, depression, and disease is extremely compelling. Chronic distress can also speed the onset of dementia. So I'm hoping, you know, my son took a different job and he's teaching himself, you know, not to be that stressed. But I hope, you know, he doesn't have early dementia because of it. Um, the reason he got neuroendocrine cancer because all the science definitively shows that plastics leach endocrine disruptors. We wrap our food in plastic. It leaches these chemicals that disrupt the endocrine system in our bodies. Most of us, our bodies are healthy enough. It doesn't bother us. My son, who's under stress for 10 years, he's the one who doesn't, can't resist it. His body gives in to endocrine, neuroendocrine cancer. Okay, so he had an operation, he had surgery. He still went back to his job. Well, then COVID hit, even more stress. He stuck with it until he finally changed jobs. He stuck with it until he had some employees that accused him falsely of um, favoring certain employees and things. And, and that was kind of the signal. That was it. So I do not know the price his body paid. Um, but when I read this book, which was afterwards, I thought, oh, my gosh, my son is a textbook case. Um, and of course, I, my students are always talking about uh, the way that the foods, they realize they're addicted to these foods and they appreciate the fact that I assigned the book. Another book, Gabor Mate, The Myth of Normal. The American Way of Life Does Not Make People Happy. It's uh, trauma, illness, and healing in a toxic culture. Our culture, it's a feature of our culture to make people mentally ill, not an accident. Developing nations need to reject the American way of living and the American-driven global capitalist system and find a new way that promotes the flourishing of their people and of the biosphere. In the USA, chronic illness, mental or physical, is to a large extent a function or feature of the way things are and not a glitch. It's a consequence of how we live and how we're forced to live, the jobs we have, the pressures on us. A toxic culture, the entire context of social structures, belief systems, assumptions, and values that surround us and necessarily pervade every aspect of our lives is toxic. It makes us mentally ill and physically ill. The current medical paradigm in the US reduces complex events to their biology. It separates mind from body. It concerns itself almost exclusively with one or the other without appreciating their essential unity. So the doctors, um, Mate and also the previous one um, were raised, you know, they were educated to think a pill is the problem or just the body, just physical stuff. But they didn't, you know, learn in medical school that it's the culture that triggers the chemistry. The chemistry isn't the main cause. The culture is the cause. The chemistry is an effect. 
Um, the U.S. global capitalist system is pulling people away from relationships, from their history, and their culture. And that also aggravates the stress, which uh, triggers the fear, cortisol. You don't have trust and goodwill for people around you. You uh, make yourself feel better by eating more and by eating sugar and you get sick. And it's just a spiral. Capitalism now encompasses an ethic, a set of teachings about how people should behave, educate their children, and even think. Its principal tenet is the economic growth, is that economic growth is the supreme good. And it's ultimately what, um, what will make everybody happy, more and more goods and services. Uh, be, because justice, freedom, and even happiness all depend on economic growth. That's not true. It's the toxic culture is causing the, the economy to grow by creating more and more goods and services that are responding to diseases, mental and physical, that never should have occurred in the first place. Capitalism's influence today runs so deep and wide, its values, assumptions, and expectations potently infuse not only culture and politics and law, but also um, also such subsystems as the academy, education, science, news, sports, medicine, child rig, and popular entertainment. The hegemony of materialistic culture is now total. <laughs> Sorry about all the typos. Um, anyway, it's horrible. You can figure this out. Neuroscience originally meant to uh, unlock the mysteries of consciousness and the brain. That was the original idea. Has just become another handmaiden of the profit motive. There's actually a field called neuromarketing. Their aim is to market happiness in a bottle or in sugar in sugar water, right? Pop, soda. Um, these corporations are acting as unscrupulous pushers in the open air, perfectly legal market of mass addiction. What is the solution? Compassion, empathy, curiosity. Why do people act this way? Recognize that everyone's suffering. Face the truth about yourself, people. Create new possibilities for yourself and others. A system of education. Do not try to imitate the West. Create a more integrated system. Create a community on campuses so students feel like part of a supportive network. Affirm the spiritual values of Islam or any of the wisdom traditions, but of all the world's traditions and of spiritual um, humanism. Um, support STEM education, but not as a replacement for relationships and compassion. Use technology to serve human well-being. Call out Western colonialism and how it's harming Indonesia and all developing nations. Call out leaders that conform to and force the people to conform to Western capitalism in its system of education, healthcare, materialism, etc competition, right, between people, between companies. Another book about this called The Anxious Generation, how the great re rewiring of childhood is causing an epidemic of mental illness. This is a very recent book. Corporations and the profit motive have targeted children and teenagers and hacked into their brains, leading to depression and suicidal ideation. Gen Z was the first generation to grow up with a smartphone that drew them into, quote, an alternative universe that was exciting, addictive, unstable, and, as I will show, unsuitable for children and adolescents. This generation spent far less time playing with, talking to, touching, even making eye contact with their friends and families thereby reducing the participation in embodied social behaviors that are essential 
for successful human development. In the real world, um, relationships and social interactions are embodied. They're synchronous. They're happening at the same time. They're one-to-one -one or one-to-several communication. One interaction at a given moment. Communities with a high bar for entrance and exit. So people are strongly motivated to invest in relationships and repair rifts when they happen. That's the real world. That's the world we evolved in. And our relationships are complicated enough without social media. Phone-based childhood has had four foundational harms, sleep deprivation, social deprivation, attention fragmentation, and addiction. For girls, social media causes mental illness. And he's an empiricist, right? He bases his thought on data. It's hard to find causal connections in data gathering, but this, he has no doubt, it's causal. Um, the attention economy destroys mental health. In Aristotle's two most basic virtues are self-control and courage. They're the ability to respond appropriately after reflection, finding the mean between extremes in situation involving immediate pleasure gratification, food, water, sex, and in situations involving fear, physical danger, illness, pain, death, also fear of failing in the economic system, fear of social ostracism, fear of social persecution, fear of loss of status, reputation. That's what social media appeals, just triggers and triggers and triggers these fears of teenagers not fitting in. Social media corporate executives know all of this and are very deliberately using neuroscience to destroy our ability to control these very primitive drives. Terrible. But I do think Aristotle is very helpful in understanding. In an attention economy, this is a quote from a social media corporate executive. In an attention economy, that's what you're, you know, that's the raw materials you're using to make money. There's only so much attention and the advertising business model always wants more. So it becomes a race to the bottom of the brainstem. He's unapologetic. They do not care. And they think of success as simply making more money, getting more customers. They don't ask why. We're just satisfying what people want. We're giving them, we're making them happy. They're free to decide what happiness is. And yet they know they're hacking the brain stem. First, to get your attention, pull to refresh rewards, reward system. Then we did infinite scroll. So your mind forgets to do anything else. As attention gets more competitive, we have to crawl deeper down the brainstem to your identity and get you addicted to getting attention from other people. By adding the number of followers and likes, technology hacks our social validation, right? Fear of social ostracism. So people are obsessed with the constant feedback they get from others. This this helped fuel a mental crisis, health crisis for teens. They don't even apologize. They know what they're doing. They're even proud of themselves figuring out how to make more money, how to be successful. The solution, once again, he comes up with the solution, the wisdom traditions. So many cultures wrote explicitly that virtuous actions bring one upward closer to God while base, selfish, or disgusting actions bring one downward away from God. Whether or not God exists, now this guy calls himself an atheist, but I think he does that because he thinks of monotheism. He's not a monotheist, okay. But he agrees with Aristotle, and he's never been exposed to any alternative. God means monotheism. 
Eh, because he's miseducated, all right? Um, whether or not God exists, people simply do perceive some people, places, actions, and objects to be sacred, pure, and elevating. Other people, places, actions, and objects are disgusting, impure, and degrading. This is exactly what I've been talking about, right? It's because mono uh, monism is true. There is this force that there are these patterns that that evolution occurs according to a pattern and that we we can identify those patterns. There's patterns in people and we've had these icons, Confucius, in, um, Muhammad, Buddha, Jesus, and Socrates, places, actions, ways of life, object, right? So, uh, yeah, this is why I like Aristotle. His model is that human beings by nature need to live for something greater than themselves. Children need to be raised to take pleasure in actions that are virtuous, just, dedicated to truth, beauty, and wisdom. And they need to take pleasure in these actions so they develop a strong character. They cannot flourish in this biological way. They can't be content. They can't uh, be functioning on a serotonin <clears throat> uh, pathways unless they live this way. <clears throat> Religious communities are a shared sacred space. So Jonathan Haidt, the author, he doesn't mention Aristotle, which means he must not be familiar with it, which is amazing. Um, you know, it tells you about our educational system and why I think it really needs, uh, we need to change our curriculum. Not just adding Aristotle, but the way that it's taught. We need to teach it with these books so that students know this is really relevant. And the, and the authors had to come to these conclusions from vague ideas about religion because they didn't get Aristotle in a meaningful way or they didn't get it at all. Pretty sad. But he does know about religious communities. Quote, the strongest and most satisfying communities come into being when something lifts people out of the lower level so that they have powerful collective experiences. They all enter the realm of the sacred together at the same time. He says, we need family rituals, holidays, ritual feasts, eating together. The author also does not mention anywhere the power of the arts, which is really surprising and disappointing, to lead us from the sensual to the spiritual. The arts were the most powerful spiritual tool in the ancient cultures. People were oral, you know, and they were, you know, everybody's sensitive to music and dance. But in the Enlightenment, the arts were completely trivialized because there was either a split between mind and body or a reduction. So, you know, art is fan is interesting designs on your wallpaper. That's Kant. Or Hume is, you know, pleasure. Just he doesn't distinguish between pleasure and art. The difference between um, sensual enjoyment and art. Art is designed to educate your emotions, including tragedy. Height doesn't even mention that. Again, he didn't he didn't get educated in Greek culture. I mean, it's just too bad because it is pretty foundational. And he didn't get educated in a meaningful way in the religious traditions. Um, you know, he understands his belief in God. Well, you don't need to really believe in God. So he assumes God is monotheism. He doesn't realize the wisdom traditions take art really seriously in a way that we should based on his view of neuroscience, his view of mental health. All right. Anyway, when people practice silence in the company of equally silent companions, so the value of science is something, I mean, silence. Again, that that's, you know, the, the ancient traditions always have a contemplative. Some of them advocate silence per se, but they certainly, you know, want, they promote quiet reflection and inner work, which confers mental health benefits. Um, 
yeah, there's uh, a lot of walking meditation. Uh, mindfulness practices originating in the spiritual realm have now become routinely introduced into psychiatric and medical practice with growing empirical evidence to support this. Be slow to anger, quick to forgive. <laughs> Voila. I mean, he's realizing that, gee, that's in the Bible somewhere, right? <laughs> because I assume he had some sort of religious training. Um, but he doesn't realize, again, it's in everybody's holy book and it's in Aristotle's virtues. People have to have a purpose and meaning in life. Well, that's because life is inherently meaningful and purposive, actually. That, that need for purpose and meaning is a natural need because it's a response to the way the universe is. And we need social, we're social and political animals. We need all these different layers of social networking. Um, so there's plenty of opportunity for meaning and purpose in creating those social networks, those political networks, all that stuff. We're biological creatures. We emerge from the biosphere around us. We're at peace with ourselves when we lose ourselves while hiking, becoming absorbed in a natural setting. That's a quote from the book. We naturally appreciate beauty of natural settings. And he taught a course in happiness at, I think, Harvard. Like these kids who are, you know, raised in prep schools and the best, the best and the brightest, the best educational system have no clue about Aristotle's view of flourishing. And one of his students said, I was so overwhelmed with how beautiful the park seemed in the spring. It felt as if the experience of beauty and awe made me more generous and drawn into the present. So these are kids who grew up with social media. He's trying to get them to rewire their brains. And this would be serotonin. Um, religious rituals always involve bodily movements with symbolic significance, often carried out synchronistically with others. Dance, Islam, Islamic prayer, you know, Prayer in Islam where people pray, you know, in huge droves. That's really important. Um, you know, in dancing in the West, you dance with a partner and you're synchron synchronous, right, with each other. Um, kneeling, praying. If you pray in a Catholic church, everybody prays together. Self-transcendence, becoming aware of one's place in the universe. So I just... I shake my head when I read the, read this and I think, really, we have to reinvent the wheel again. But, you know, it gives me a sense of purpose. Um, so the stuff I figured out because of my, my calling, my natural orientation was I figured this out in high school, basically. But then because of the society, here I am uh, 40 years later. How many years? 50 years later, going, okay, <laughs> I guess it's my destiny to sort of point out to people that, hey, yeah, um, and this guy realizes this, and this sort of prominent intellectual that graduated from Harvard teaches at Harvard, you know, all this stuff. The trouble is, there are also people who graduate from Harvard, teach at Harvard, who deliberately use neuroscience to cultivate fear to either make huge amounts of money in corporations or to amass power in our political system. So now we have Tom Cruise, jo Josh Hawley, Tom Cotton, people from Yale and Harvard Law School who are very carefully triggering cortisol, especially, and unbelievable. They're destroying our democracy and they don't seem to care. They seem to even know that they're doing that and they want to be part of an authoritarian administration, which is really scary. So what you have are these Harvard level educated people. Some of them are buying right into authoritarianism. Others are just going, hey, you know, uh, whoops, you know, we have to get back to religion, or I would say, hello, could we use Aristotle to call out 
the Tom Cruise, you know, Tom Cruise Cotton Holly contingent could we use Aristotle to call out the materialism, the capitalism? Yes. <laughs> but people like DeSantis are using Aristotle to perpetuate this authoritarian system, which uh, Aristotle has been used for that in the past. So you have to call it out once again. Aristotle himself was almost killed <laughs> in Athens because he questioned the authorities. So I don't think DeSantis represents Aristotle, even on the surface of it, right? He's co-opted. He's become part of the status quo, just like Martin Luther King said that religious leaders are. Um, all right. So that's how I would label prophets, these people. That's what this lecture is especially for, is to say not only do these people get back to Aristotle, whether they're aware of it consciously and deliberately or not. But they're prophets. So the religious traditions, the, the wisdom traditions are either founded by prophets or the Old Testament has a prophetic tradition. And these people are prophets. And so we should see again these patterns. We think we're so different. We think they have, we have all this knowledge and technology. We think we can socially re-engineer the psyche so that people are virtuous. No, we're socially re-engineering the psyche to make them miserable, mentally ill, physically ill, to, to uh, become so afraid that they give up their democracy for authoritarianism. Horrible. And so the real Aristotelians and the real prophets and the real so Socratic Socrateses are prophets and they need to call it out. So that's what this set of lectures is really modeled after that pattern, among others, but that's one.